So our first topic today is going to be uh, arc length. Now, the concept with arc length, um, a lot of people kind of get confused what's going on. The analogy I like to use is when I'm when I'm in the classroom, I'm standing in the front of the room and we have a door in the back of the room and all the all the math building rooms. And I want to walk to the door in the back of the room. Now, if I drew a line segment from where I'm standing to the door, that's easy. That's just distance formula from remedial algebra. The problem is there's a bunch of desks in the way. So when I'm walking, you know, I'm doing a bit of a serpentine through the desks and I'm getting to the other side of the room. Great. So the question is, how long was the path that I just went on? It wasn't linear. You know, I had some little bends. So you'd say, hmm. The path I just traveled should be a little bit longer than the length of the line segment. And that's that's reasonable. And that's actually a great way to check an answer is when you get an answer, compare it to the length of the line segment because the length of the line segment would be shorter, but maybe not by a big deal. But how do I calculate that length? I mean, that's not a trivial thing. It's a curve. So probably calculus is involved. So let me really quickly, I'm going to review something that we all know, and that's the definition of the derivative. So if y equals f of x, <clears throat> then dy dx, which also equals f prime of x, is equal to the limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x, or f of x plus delta x minus f of x. These statements say exactly the same thing. We did this physically because we always said y is f of x and we took f of x. But technically my numerator is delta y, okay? So if y equals a function of x, then the change of y is the change in f of x. These are identical statements. This is sort of the working one we use, but there's no difference between these. Both of these are the derivative. You see dy dx is this, f prime of x is this, and they are equal to each other. We're going to draw on that statement in just a little bit, but I just want to remind you of something you already know, but we haven't used in quite a while. So now here's the, here's the situation. <clears throat> I'm going from here, you know, to here. And let's say that's, you know, um, x0, y0, and that's x1, y1. All right, keep it simple. My curve is y equal to x. All right, no big deal. I want to find the length of this curve. Now, generally, when you're talking about arc length, you always say it from point to point. We don't actually usually say it from x coordinate to x coordinate because this isn't an area under a curve. So I, I basically want to go from this point to this point. So, like I said before, if I just simply drew a line segment and I found the length of the line segment, that would be an extremely crude estimation, okay? And it probably wouldn't be very good if I'm wiggly. Um, can anybody give me an idea? How, how could I do a better estimation of that? If, if that line segment is not a very good estimation, I mean, I can calculate the line segment. That's really, really easy. Because distance formula is just the delta x squared plus delta y squared under the square root. Can, can anybody offer up a suggestion that might give me a better estimation than that one? Since it's, a, since it's an arc, can't we do something with, um, uh, let's say, circles? Like, no, say, it's like, no? no? Okay. no. no break, can we break segments? Say again? Break it into segments. How about more? More segments. Yeah, more segments. Yeah. More cowbell, as we know. Ah, what if I do, what if I did that? Do you agree that the second suggestion, Gil's suggestion, would be better? Would it be equal? No, but would it be closer? Oh, yes. Do you guys smell it? it? Smells like a limit, doesn't it? Right? More segments, each one shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. You guys see it? That's where the calculus will come in. Okay, if one segment is crude, five segments would be better. 5,000 segments, better still infinitely many segments, perfect. So what I want to do is take one of these pieces. I'm going to take that one right there and I'm going to blow it up. So, all right, I want to estimate the length of that curve using the length of that line segment. Because like we just said, if I calculate the lengths of a bunch of segments and add them up, that's a very good estimator of the overall length. But how do I actually even estimate the length of the line segment? So let's 
basically make a right triangle here. So that's my delta X and that's clearly my delta Y. Now, for whatever reason, I wasn't there when the Universal Math Council decided on notation. You know, we use M for slope. Does anybody know what letter we always use for arc length? And this is in every math course. What letter is always used for arc length? Uh, P. Actually, S. <laughs> Again, S, I don't know. I mean, like I said, we use M for slope. I don't know, maybe it was because it came from Latin or something. Whenever you see a small S in a calculus context, it always means arc length. Again, I, I find it kind of funny. So this would be the actual change in the arc length. This would be what we called our incremental change. Now, remember when we did the tangent line estimators? We had the curve and the tangent line left the curve and we used the tangent line to estimate the value on the curve. So we used dy to estimate delta y. You guys remember that? That's, so delta y was the actual change, dy was our estimated change. We, we've done this problem before. So you know, I had the, the square root function and I wanted to estimate at a point. So what you did was you took the tangent line Right, and you use the value on the tangent line to estimate the value on the curve and all that kind of stuff. That's the notation. The D refers to differential, delta is the actual. So I'm going to use DS to estimate delta S. That's the very first thing. So delta S is going to be estimated by DS. They cannot be equal, that would be impossible. That can never equal that. But I can make it if it's if the delta X and delta Y are small enough, they're going to be so close. So how do I figure this? Now let's, we're gonna do a whole bunch. So technically this would be the ith one. So I'm gonna put little i's under here. Now the actual change in the line and the, and the excuse me, the actual change of, del, of x and y in the curve is the same as the change of x and y in the line segment. These two lengths are different. So this is gonna be simply delta xi squared plus delta yi squared. Okay, that's it. That's really not that complicated. The problem is algebraically speaking, I can't really do anything with that. Well, at least not yet. And particularly from a calculus standpoint, I have too many variables. So we got to deal with that as well. So now I want to do a little bit of algebra. If I ask the following question, if I said I have a squared plus b squared, and I want you to factor out, I want you to factor out an a squared, what would I be left with? Anybody? One over b squared over a squared? Um, not quite. It's in one plus b squared over a squared. Ah, there we go, one plus. Do you all agree with that? That's absolutely correct, okay? In this statement here, I want to factor out the square of the delta x term. In other words, I want to do this algebra to that statement, all right? So then that means that I should have, I'm gonna factor out the delta x squared. So that would be a one plus the square of delta y over the square of delta x. I'll put the square, I'll put this on the other side just to make it easier to read. The square root I'm doing last because I'm factoring inside. So does everybody agree then? I just used this algebra on this statement. So if I distribute, I should be back to where I was. So now let's clean up that statement just a little bit. So let me first write this as one plus, now I know the quotient of the square is the square of the quotient, I know that. And delta X cannot be negative. Delta Y can be, as I'm moving on my curve, Y can go up and down, but X is moving left to right, meaning I can take the square root of this squared and pull this out of the square root. So I want that outside. And you're going, you know, that kind of looks like the stuff that shows up in a Riemann sum, doesn't it? I, I got something and I got a delta X and all that. Well, right now, this is just geometry. There's no calculus going on. The length of this segment is exactly equal to this quantity. So now I can say the whole arc length can be estimated by the sum of all N of them. I, I broke it up into N little line segments. When I add up all of their individual lengths, I'm basically doing this. And in this case, my x would range from, I called it, uh, I think I said I'm going from x0 to x1. Okay, whatever the numbers were, I'm just going to throw that in. You know, 
that looks very much like the Riemann sum. In fact, all I have to do is take the limit. The, oh, because there's a delta x, I can do the limit thing. So I can now say that s equals the limit as the norm of the partition goes to zero of this quantity. Now, this is huge, I'm about to do. Problem is, I want to be able to write this as a definite integral. Remember, once I have the Riemann sum, we could always go to the definite integral. Problem is, that doesn't look like any integrand I've ever seen before. So here's where it gets really cool. Now, what I'm about to show you, you're not going to find on any YouTube video, and it does not exist in any textbook that I've ever seen in my entire life. But what we're doing, what we're going to do next is the most important part of the problem. And I'm not sure why the next thing I'm going to do isn't illustrated. I've never actually seen this done in any situation. I never saw this done in a classroom, but I am the inquisitive person who says, wait a minute, I know what the formula is. How did we come up with a formula? I've never actually heard an explanation of where the formula comes from. I just, everyone just knows there's a formula. We know stuff about limits. First thing, isn't the limit of a sum the sum of the limits? Do we know that as an absolute? Yeah, that's one of the most important limit properties. So without me rewriting it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this limit, I'm gonna move it into there. So in other words, the limit of this summation is the sum of all the limits. So now I have a limit right here. But isn't the limit of the root the root of the limits? So what am I now going to do? And now I have a sum of two, term, two terms. I have the limit of one plus the limit of this. Well, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. OK, so I've now moved my limit all the way into here. I have the limit of a square. Wouldn't that be the square of the limit? So what I just, I'm saving myself some time, rather than write equals, 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 equals. I've moved the limit all the way inside of here. So this is now equal to the sum from i equal one to n of the square root of one plus the limit as the norm of the partition approaches zero of delta y i over delta x i quantity squared delta x i. All right. This is what I'm doing. This is the calculus. So I can go all the way inside. And here's the key. What does the norm of the partition mean again? Does anybody remember when I'm dividing up, you know, my areas and I have all my rectangles, what is the norm of the partition in simple English? Um, evenly spaced partitions. No, they're not evenly spaced. Remember, they're random, random widths. Remember, I brought my shrink ray to class. Some of you are still having nightmares about that. And I shrunk all of you down to a single point. Remember, I always went after the biggest person. The norm of the partition is the largest delta x. It's the largest width. That's what, that's what it means. But now I'm, I'm down to only one thing. The norm of the partition, but there's only one delta x. It's just that one. So this norm of the partition approaching zero is exactly the same as me just simply saying delta x approaches zero. It's the same thing. Does this ring a bell to anybody? The limit as delta x approaches zero of delta y over delta x. Does that ring a bell? <laughs> um, is it like, like when the sine is equal to zero? What did I start the class by doing? I did this. What is this? This is called the definition of, definition of the derivative. <laughs> That's why I, re I reminded you at the beginning of class. This quantity, this quantity is dy dx. The limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x. Oh, now we can write an integrand. You see, I, that, I can't have an integrand with delta y and delta x in it. That doesn't make any sense. See, when we do the Riemann sum, there was always a function here. And then that function went directly into our integral. The problem is I don't have anything to put in an integral yet. But now I do. I'm going to write it up here. We have now just derived the formula for arc length. S is equal to, and I'll, I'm going to use the same picture. I'll say X1 to X2. Those are, uh, I'm sorry, X0 to X1. I, I called them 0, 1. These are constants. These were the X coordinates. Of what? Of the square root of 1 plus dy dx quantity squared integrated with respect to X. And this is the formula we just derived. That formula is in every calculus book ever written. <laughs> The derivation of that formula, I've never seen anywhere in my entire life. Nope, nope, you're lucky if your textbook goes this far. 
they'll go this far and then they'll give you this and they'll say, how do you make that leap? Well, it's because of the Riemann sum and the limit moving inside, 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 inside. That's why it's so necessary to be aware of this. You're never gonna have to derive this on your own, but that shouldn't be a mystery, okay? No one should just say, here's a formula, memorize it. <laughs> That's not mathematics. So now I have a formula to find the length of the curve. And this, by the way, will work for any curve. Our dilemma is real simple. Our dilemma is that if I give you a function, more often than not, you won't be able to do anything. So what do you mean? Let's start with something really simple. Let's take a really simple curve. Let's say um, I've got y equals x cubed from 0, 0 to 2 comma 8. Okay, I, I want to come, not, not complicated, not even a sine wave, just a simple polynomial-ish thing. So this is going to go like this. Okay, I'm 0, 0, I am 2 comma 8. I want to find the length of this curve. Okay, there's an order of things that I would like you to do. Um, what I don't like writing, I don't like putting things in an integral and write integral equals integral equals integral equals integral while I'm doing all my algebra. I like to do all of the algebra first. Then when you write the integral, you can now evaluate the integral. That's a better way. So there's an order of things. Let's start with dy dx. dy dx will be 3x squared. Next. What is one plus the square of dy dx? That would be one plus the square of this. That's one plus nine x to the fourth. So now I can say the length of the curve is the integral from zero to two, because those are my x coordinates, of the square root of this. Right. Was that difficult to come up with? Not at all. Now what? What's the next thing we're going to do? Anybody? Might surprise you what we're going to do next. The antiderivative? Well, we, it would be nice if we could. I'm pretty good at calculus, and I can't do could it. Could we simplify it first? Mm. At least with that one. What would you do? How would you simplify it? <laughs> so what we do at this point? It's we just wave and we say bye and then we move on to the next problem. Why? Because this cannot be done. <laughs> We're done. That cannot be integrated. There is no cool technique you're going to learn in the future. This is impossible to go any further with. And in fact, of all of the functions that exist, I took a simple one, of all the functions that exist in, 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 in Calc 1, now in Calc 2 you learn some tricks, in Calc 1 of all the functions that exist, only three of them can you actually find the length of the curve. Three of the infinitely many that exist, you can only do this for three different functions. Wow, <laughs> that's kind of limiting. Why? Because in general, if I wanted to integrate this, all of us would probably be on the same boat and say, you know what? I think I'd like to do a u substitution. I want that to be my u. So, what's the problem with choosing that as my u? What am I lacking? Another x? Yeah, I, I'd need an x cubed out here, wouldn't I? In other words, there's no du. So for of the infinitely many functions that exist, it probably would make sense most of the time to pick this as your u. You're just never gonna have a du. It's just not gonna be there in general. So that's why I said most textbooks will say, set up the integral for the length of the curve. Set up the integral. <laughs> and then you wave at it. Next semester, you're going to learn a few more things that will allow you to expand that base of the ones you can do, but it's still not a very long list. So let's do one of the ones you can do. In fact, we're gonna do a couple that you can do because it's so cool, all right? It, it does seem kind of odd that we would do a problem that you can't finish, but we learn techniques in Calc 2 that even if we can't calculate that directly, we learn techniques where we can do forms of estimation to basically, I could give you as many decimals as you need accurately, even though I don't know what the answer is. I could, you need 10 decimals? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. I'll give you 10 decimals. Let's consider uh, the graph of y equals x to the two thirds from how about one, one to, uh, let's say eight comma four. Now we know what this is. This is 
The graph of this guy, it's a cool graph, looks like this. Okay, I want to go from one one, let's say about right there, to let's just say that's eight comma four. I'm not worried about the the perfection of my graph. It's something like that. Now this curve is not rapidly moving, so the length of the line segment joining these and the length of the curve probably aren't going to be too far apart. And I'm going to use that as a great uh, way of checking my final answer. This is one of the problems we can do from beginning to end. You might, you might say, well, how can we do this one? This is far more complicated than the last one. Well, let's see. So let's start with what is dy dx? If this is y, then dy dx is 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Next, what is 1 plus the square of dy dx? Well, that'd be 1 plus 4 ninths x to the negative 2 thirds. Everybody cool with that? Now, I don't like the way that looks, so let's, let's clean this up a little bit. So 1 plus 4 over 9 x to the 2 thirds, okay? Now, lastly, because that's going to go under a root, why don't we put that, make that into one quotient? So if I made this into one quotient, it would now be 9x to the 2 thirds plus 4 all over 9x to the 2 thirds. Okay? So my integral, I, I'm, I'm going to erase this because I'm going to need all the space. So my integral will look like this. The integral from one to eight, because those are my x limits, of the square root of this. Great. How am I supposed to do this? Well, look at your denominator for a moment. Isn't your denominator a perfect square? Isn't nine x to the two thirds a perfect square? In fact, what is being squared there? What is the square root of 9x squared? Because I, I want to pull that out. Um, 3x to the 3 over 2? Mm, 3x to the, I'm taking the square root, so I'm, that just means I'm taking half the exponent. So then it's 1 over 3? 1 over 3. OK. Now. Is this getting better or getting worse? I don't know. But I maintain we can do this. Let me erase this. Well, if I was going to do a substitution, I have something under a root. That pretty much has to be where my substitution comes from. So if I let u equal 9x to the 2 thirds plus 4, what would my du be, everybody? What would my du be? Uh, 6x. Uh, yeah. OK, well, yeah, like I've got an x to the negative 1 third sitting around in my, in oh, I do. <laughs> it's right there. Does everyone see my chain rule factor? It's there. So like I said, there's only a few problems that you can actually do. This is one of them because the chain rule factor will be in the integram. So I need to rewrite this. I need to write this in a better, more viewable form. So what if I do this? That's 9x to the 2 thirds plus 4 to the 1 half. What is this? This is 1 third x to the negative 1 third. Okay, everybody cool with that? I just rewrote this. I haven't changed anything. Now, all I need is a six. So remember what we do? Let's take that one third and let's put it on the outside. I need six. So I'm gonna introduce six. And then on the outside, I'm gonna put one sixth. Right now I have one eighteenth on the outside. I have six on the inside. Of course that multiplies to one third. I haven't changed anything. I now have it of the form u to the one half du. Hmm. So all I need to do now is change my limits of integration. If I'm going to do a substitution, there is no mathematical process to do a substitution without changing these. Remember that you, you don't have a choice there. So as x ranges from one to eight, the value of u will range from what? 
Well, when x is one, one to the two thirds power is still one. So this will be nine plus four or 13. When x is eight, eight to the two thirds, that's cube root squared. Well, cube root of eight would be two, two squared would be four, okay? Well, you know, that's where the four came from. So eight to the two thirds is four. Four times nine plus four, that would be 40. Okay, so my new problem, my new and improved problem is 1 18th, the integral from 13 to 40 of u to the 1 half du. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't scare me. That looks pretty simple at this point. So I'm going to get u to what power? The 3 over 2. 3 over 2. Now, times 2 thirds times 1 18th. If you got to do that off to the side, do that off to the side. Now the one over, I'm sorry, two over 54, so one over 27. And a quick check, three halves times one over 27. Okay, that works. From 13 to 40. Okay, so my answer is one 27th, 40 to the three halves minus 13 to the three halves. And you know what? I'm just going to leave it like that because 40 is not a perfect square. 13 is not a perfect. I can't do a whole lot of manipulation with that answer. Yeah, I might be able. I can pull out a root four and all that. I can just walk away. Now, I'm pretty sure I did the problem correctly. Pretty sure. Remember what I said we could use as a check? We could use the length of the line segment joining these two points. Because the length of the line segment should be shorter than this answer. If this answer turned out to be shorter than the length of the line segment, then I know I have an error. Does everybody understand that? The curve has to be longer than the line segment. Okay. Well, let's get out our calculators. I think I had one. Oh, there it is. Hold on. All right. Let's calculate this length. Again, I'm going to Home Depot later and I need, you know, I need 127, 40 to the three house minus 13 to the three house feet of wood. <laughs> I think I would have them quite confused. So let's calculate that. All right, my calculator says this is about, this is approximately 7.6337. It's infinite decimal, I'll just give that far. Like, ah, that's probably overkill, okay. Now, Let's calculate the length of the line segment. You guys remember how to do that? This minus this is seven. Four minus one is three under the square root. That's it. That's the distance formula from baby algebra. This is the length of the line segment, 49 plus nine. All right. The length of the line segment is exactly the square root of 58. All right. How big is the square root of 58? That's approximately... 7.6158. Is that good? This is a little bit less than this. And again, the curve did not bend a whole lot. It only bends a, a little bit. So the length of our curve was slightly longer than the length of the line segment. That's a good thing, by the way. If this value had been way bigger than this value, we'd be a little bit suspicious. When, and if this value were smaller, then we know we did it wrong. The one thing you can always do is you can always measure the length of the line segment. That's, that's trivial. That takes seconds. And that's what I can use as kind of a quick and dirty check to see, is my answer at least reasonable? You see, if that's seven, this came out 30, I would be a little suspicious, <laughs> right? Because again, it, it wasn't that much deviation. So this is the process for finding arc length. Yikes. All right, let's do another one. Let's suppose my race is starting to die here. We'll do one more arc length problem before we move on. All right. Let's find the length of the curve of y equals the square root of r squared minus x squared from negative r zero to r zero. R is a constant. Does anybody know what that is? A circle or? You're half right. Uh, hemisphere, no? Semicircle. Semicircle. Which, which half? 
the top half. The top oh, half, because y is the positive square root. So I just asked you to find the length of the semicircle. Um, the reason I can't ask you to find the length of the circle is I cannot write the circle as a function. Everybody understands that. Top half of the circle is a function, bottom half is a circle of function. I'm asking you to find the length of half the circle. So in other words, in, in English, I'm asking you to find half of what? Half the circumference. Half the circumference. Everybody cool with that? I'm asking you to find half the circumference of a circle of radius r. Okay. Well, it turns out this one we can do. You're going to like this. This is eminently cool. All right. Well, there's my y. So I need to do one plus the square of dy dx and then put that under a square root, manipulate that all, all I can. So think of this as being raised to the one half power instead. Then dy dx would be one half r squared minus x squared to the negative one half times negative two x. Okay. That would be negative x over the square root of r squared minus x squared. Okay. So next, one plus the square of dy dx would be one plus. Now the square of this would be x squared over r squared minus x squared. I think it's safe to say that we need to put this over one quotient like the last problem, but this will come out very nice. When I put this over one quotient, that's going to be r squared minus x squared over r squared minus x squared plus x squared. Huh. You guys liking how that looks? So when I put this over one quotient, I get this. Remember, your integrand is the square root of this. So I am ready to write my integral. Now, my x limits are clearly negative r to positive r. So I can now say the length of the curve is the square root of this. So that would be r over the square root of r squared minus x squared dx. Now, can I take advantage of anything before I continue? Anybody notice anything? Even function, uh, symmetric limits. Beautiful. Even function, symmetric limits. R is a number. R is not a variable. If R were a variable, that wouldn't be an even function, but R isn't a variable. The only variable is X squared. So I have constant, I have X squared, everything's even degree. So the first thing I want to do is do the doubling thing. So this would equal two times the limit from zero to R. And in fact, R is a constant, but a lot of you are looking at that R and not sure what to do with it. So I'm going to move the R to the outside. I think it would just be a better idea. So let's write that as two R and then I just have a one. Oh, okay. That might be easier. Now, now what? Uh, do we have a formula that looks like this? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. We have a formula that looks like this, but instead of R squared, it has an A squared. Inverse sine? Inverse sine. Do I have to do any clever substitutions or anything? No. That's what the formula looks like. It's exactly the formula. Oh, so inverse, this would be 2R inverse sine. Remember, that's my constant. So it would be 1 over R times X. Does inverse sine get the extra 1 over R on the outside? No. No, only inverse secant and inverse tangent do inverse sine does not. That, that, always, that always throws people a little bit. Wow, that was, a, that was a really simple antiderivative. So I'm going to have 2r times the inverse sine of 1 over r times r, that's 1, minus the inverse sine of 1 over r times 0. OK, let's take the freebie. Sine of what angle is 0? Sine of what angle is 0? i got to be between negative pi or 1. Two. Sine of 1 is 0. 0? No, sine, sine of 0 is 0. Sine so this, zero, this is 0. zero. Now, sine of what angle is 1? 90. Pi, pi over 2. Uh, so pi over 2. By the way, I, I like that you said 90. You see, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So use your calculator. You guys remember what to do? Put it in degree mode. Put it in degree mode. And I'm going to go inverse sine 1 in degree mode. Ah, 
pi over two. If, if I can't, if, if inverse sine of one does not immediately come to my brain, put your calculator in degree mode. Oh, it's 90 degrees. Okay, pi over two, beautiful. You can always do that. So what have I got now? That's pi over two. So I have two R times pi over two or pi R. We have just derived that half the circumference of a circle is pi R, which means the entire circumference is what? Pi R squared. Wrong way. Pi, two pi R. Two, two pi R. Oh, but I already knew the circumference of a circle is two pi R. And this is the only way that can actually be derived. We just derived the circumference of a circle. You just accepted a fact before that. There is no mathematics that exists. It will get you to the circumference of the circle, except this. Oh, now remember what I said last day, things, things that are circular in nature, you know, spheres, circles, things, all require calculus to come up with their geometric formulas. But again, the ancient Greeks, they knew the circumference of a circle. How? We know, you know, agent K and agent J kind of fill this in on all that. But anyway, I, I just think this is really cool because that integration was not terrible. Okay, so setting at the very least, setting up the integral to find arc length, for the most part, is actually fairly simple. Being able to actually integrate that thing, it depends on the function you're given. But I said there's not very many out there. So the one I did that was the cusp, that's one of the few you can do. Semicircle is another one. So now I want to move on to surface area because that's kind of the biggest ticket item. You know, it's the gnarliest of all the integrations. So let's do a little bit of geometric review first. Okay, um, there's a, a tremendous amount of geometry required in the development of calculus. In Calc 3, for example, I'd say at least 25% of Calc 3 is just straight up geometry because there's so many things that we need to remember in order to get the calculus stuff. So let me start with something fairly simple. If I have a circle, and I go from the center of the circle, then that angle, that's called a central angle. By the way, it's only called a central angle if that's the center of the circle. This is the radius of the circle. This piece right here, we generally will call S. That's the, the length of that curve. That's the arc length of that part of the circle. And let's call the, this thing the area. Um, this pie-shaped wedge actually has a name. A, 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 you know, it, it, you know, you have a square, you have triangle, you have circle. What is the pie-shaped wedge that I've just drawn from the center of the circle? Does anybody remember? A sector. Sector. This is called the sector of a circle. By the way, if that point was not the center, then none of, none of what I'm doing would be relevant. I wouldn't be able to come up with formulas. There's a set of equal ratios that I can easily state from this picture. Um, think of it really simple. If I said, for example, let's take exactly one fourth of the circle then I would have exactly one fourth of the total angle. I'd have exactly one fourth of the total area. I'd have exactly one fourth of the total arc length. So in other words, the fraction of the circle that I have should be the same fraction for each of these. So the set of equal ratios are theta is to the entire angle, which is two pi, not 360 degrees, by the way, because two pi is a measurement as a is to pi r squared. That's the area of the entire circle as s is to 2 pi r, that's the entire circumference. We just, in fact, derived that. There are three equal ratios here. If I put any two of them together, that's how you form a proportion. That Most people don't actually know what a proportion is. They, they know it if they saw it. A proportion is simply two equal ratios. That's what the word comes from. So if I put the first two together, for example, then I can say that, I'll put these together. I can say then that a equals, theta over two pi times pi r squared, which is one half r squared theta. That's actually a very important formula. My lecture yesterday in Calc 2, the entire lecture was based on that formula and they were doing integration with what are called polar coordinates. That formula is where we got all our integration. If I put, let's say, these two together and I wanted to know the arc length, then I'd have s equals theta over two pi times two pi r which means arc length is simply r theta. Whoa, the length of the radius times the angle gives me the length of the arc. Yeah, that's an absolute, very important geometric formula. But although you may have worked with both of these in the past, we're gonna do the most obscure of the bunch. 
And really, of all of the math that you ever do in your life, this is probably the only time you really want to do these two together. Strangely enough, I want to put those two together and figure out what I can, what I can surmise here. And we want the area. So if I put these two together, then the area would be S over 2 pi r times pi r squared. Now, obviously, I get some nice canceling here. So if I put these two together, what am I left with? Let's see, that would cancel, and that would cancel, and that would cancel, and that would cancel. And I get the area in terms of, of this would be 1 half Rs. Now, that's not one that people see. I like to give you an idea of how where, where that kind of fits in. I've just, I just told you how to find the area of the sector. The area of the sector is exactly one half times the radius times the arc. If I thought of a triangle for a moment, a triangle, if I just said, make this into a triangle, isn't the area of a triangle one half base times height? One half base times height. So this is kind of like saying, well, the, the, the height is kind of like R and the base is kind of like S and I'm getting one half, it's kind of like one half base times height. It's not exactly the same, but you can kind of see the analogy. Oh yeah, okay. So this, this is the huge geometric thing that I'm gonna use the rest of this class. I need that guy right there. So now here's what I wanna do next. Now I'm gonna do some geometry that it's very likely you have never seen in your life. I taught high school geometry for several years. That was the coolest class. And to me, I mean, it's the most important class you take in high school. Not because I taught it. I taught it because it's the most important class. It's the only class anybody's ever had where they actually learned logic and analytical and deductive reasoning. You see, you use triangles to help you navigate, but that, that was just the vehicle. That wasn't the end goal. You learned how to make logical arguments and deductions. You wrote proofs. You know, that, that gives you the segue into doing higher levels of math. I want you to consider a circular cone. Okay, well, let's keep it really simple. A circular cone, radius we'll call R, or the height we'll call H. And then we've got this thing right here. Generally, that's referred to as the slant or the slant height of a cone. This is a circular cone. Now, I'm pretty sure you all could tell me the volume of the cone. Remember, it's one third the volume of the circular cylinder. So it's one third pi r squared h, piece of cake. I'm not interested in the volume of this cone. I'm interested in the surface area of this cone. And of course, everybody knows the surface area formula for a cone, right? Does anybody know the surface area formula for a cone? In about two weeks, no, three weeks, I'm going to have my 35th year anniversary at Mesa College. I, by the way, I've only met one human being in my entire life, one. Paul Brock at San Diego State, he taught the graduate geometry courses. I've met one human being in my entire life who actually knows the surface area of a cone. It's that obscure. You know what it is? Yeah, the surface area of a cone is one of the most obscure formulas because you all know volume. When do you ever use surface area? You, you may never have seen this, but because I taught high school geometry, I needed to know this when I taught it, um, I want to find the surface area of this thing, but how the heck am I supposed to do that? Oh, I just happen to have a cone. <laughs> I made a circular cone for you. I want the surface area of this cone. Now, remember, we know what the area of the sector of the circle is. Okay, great. How's that supposed to help me? Well, <clears throat> clearly there's a Pythagorean relationship between R, H, and the slant. That's nice, but that's not what I need. I need the surface area of the cone. So what if I did this? Oops, sorry, I have a piece of tape here. What if I took my cone and I opened it up? Huh, how interesting. If I take this same cone and I open it up, oops, sorry, let me, I'll do it this way. If I take this cone and I open it up, it's gonna look like this. There we go, there's my cone. I just took this cone here and I opened it up. Well, this is now two dimensional. Uh, anybody got any ideas? What, what is that shape right there? Sector. That is a sector of a circle. I think you can all see it. I did my best job with, with my scissors to kind of make this look. This is the sector of a circle. 
And I absolutely know the area of a sector. We just derived it. What was the area of the sector again? The area of the sector was what? It was one half, I'm gonna write it in words, radius arc length. And the reason I'm gonna write it in words and not letters is because the letters are not really, this radius and this radius won't be the same. So it was one half radius times arc length. So let's start. This radius right here, that's clearly the radius of my cone. Oh, the radius of my cone is equivalent to what? The slant. Does everybody see that? The radius of the cone is equivalent to the, I'm sorry, the, the radius of the sector is equivalent to the slant of the cone. Ooh, let me write that down there. The slant of my cone is the radius of the sector. Now I need this arc length. What's another name for that arc length? The circumference of the circle? For the, the, the circle. See, so this is my high tech visual aids, folks. The circumference of this circle, when I open it up, is the length of that arc. Well, let's go back to this. What is the circumference of the circle? Isn't it two pi r? Didn't we just derive that? So based on this cone, that length being called the slant and that being the radius, this is my two pi r. So for this cone, you can now tell me the surface area. It's going to be one half this quantity times this quantity using this, which is one half the slant of the cone times two pi r. Oh, the twos will cancel. So it's pi r, I'm going to write it this way, pi r slant. Okay. For this cone right here with radius r, height h, and slant height here, the surface area is this. Like I said, this is obscure. Now, when I was doing high school geometry, we were just doing the cone. And so instead of the word slant, we usually just use, this is terrible, but because they weren't doing arc lengths, we were, the, the textbooks would use S for slant. I know that's really bad because we're using S for arc length, but arc length is a different context. If I have a cone, there's no arc length really to calculate. So in the textbooks, they would use a, an S. So in the, in the high school geometry, they would actually write it that way where this S referred to slant height. Now, I <laughs> this is what you have to understand. This is, I know this is really weird and warped, but I'm, what, what I'm about to tell you. I taught, I taught at Mesa in the evenings and I taught high school in the day at a private school, a very, very wealthy private school where like the kids were driving cars that were worth a lot more than any of the teachers made in a year. I kid you not. I mean, I, we had kids brought in to school in, in limousines and some of them armored cars. That was kind of creepy. And so to, for the kids to remember this, now you have to understand when you, when you grow up and your parents are bazillionaires, you usually have a concept of money and taxes and things like that. So being the most obscure and one of the most difficult formulas to remember, the kids remember this formula as being one of the most taxing formulas, one of the most taxing formulas. What's the formula out loud? Say, say it out loud. IRS. IRS is one of the most taxing formulas they learned. No kid ever had trouble. Ha ha ha. Yeah. You like that? I, by the way, if you didn't grow up as a spoiled rich kid, that would just go right past you. But if you grew up as a spoiled rich kid, you absolutely understood the concept of IRS. <laughs> In fact, we had more than one kid whose parents were serving time because of tax fraud. The kids had bazillions of dollars. The parents were able to hide it away on foreign islands and the parents were serving time. I'm not joking. It was crazy. PIRS was the most taxing formula and it rhymed with IRS. And so they all remembered it. So I don't know. That, that was, I know it was as weird as it is. I don't want you to remember this. I want you to remember this. Pi R slant. Okay. That, so that's the surface area of a cone. Here's what I want to do. I want to chop off part of the cone. I want to lop off the top of the cone and just work, oops, with this. 
the, the part that's left. And that's a terrible picture. Everybody understand? I want this. And what I want to figure out is what is the surface area of the part that is left? Are we just going to do the subtraction now? Because we just have a smaller cone on top. We know that. And we would know the smaller cone on bottom. So just subtract them. Something like that. Does, now, this actually has a name. Now, if you've ever been to the circus, you know, this is the thing that the elephants put their feet on. You guys know what I'm talking about? This actually has a name. And, and this is the thing we're going to find. It's as difficult it is to find the surface area of a cone. That's actually not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal was to find the surface area of this shape. This is called the frustum of a cone. Yeah, talk about obscure. We want the surface area of the frustum of a cone. Every calculus book gives you the final result. What I love is the calculus books will say things like, you remember this from high school geometry, that they'll actually say things like that. You remember this result. And the funny part is, is I've never met a human being who's actually seen the area of a frustum of a cone derived. We need this area. Now, Nate's exactly right. Big cone minus little cone, beautiful. But the problem is there's too many variables. I need to whittle this down to something. In other words, that slant and that slant is pretty easy to understand. But what about that distance? I need that distance. I've got that radius and that radius. That's pretty easy to understand, but I, I kind of need to put them together. So that's the last piece of the puzzle. And we will be able to then derive the formula for surface area. And it's pretty cool because it's simple geometry. So. Uh, all right. Now I'm going to remind you of a not an obscure geometric fact, but an actual really important geometric fact that, again, um, some of you may or may not remember because it involves triangles. It doesn't matter what kind of triangle I have. I'm going to make this purposely. You know, this is called scalene. There's nothing special about it. In every triangle, if you draw a segment that is parallel to one of the sides, I'm making that segment parallel to the side. I form a smaller triangle. And one thing we absolutely know, the big triangle, the little triangle share that angle. The big triangle has that angle. The little triangle has that angle. Parallel lines cut by a transversal corresponding angles are congruent. That's a very, very, very important geometry theorem. Some of you may or may not remember that. These are congruent. Parallel lines cut by a transversal, the corresponding angles are congruent. So the big triangle had these three angles. The little triangle has exactly the same three angles. Meaning if I draw a segment that's parallel to one side, then the small triangle and the big triangle are, does anybody know the word? It's not congruent. Similar? Similar, beautiful. Similar shapes look identical, but are not necessarily the same size. Simple example, all circles are the same shape, but they're not the same size. So all circles are similar. All squares are similar. All triangles are not similar. You can make triangle infinitely many shapes. Oh, but these two triangles are similar. Why is that important? Because in similar shapes, all of the sides have equal ratios, meaning this side is to this side, as this side is to this side, as this side is to this side. Keep it really simple. If this side was half the length of this side, then this side would be half the length of this side, and this would be half the length of this. The ratios are preserved. That's why similar shapes are really, really important to understand. We're going to create a similar shape when we, we do our frustum, and that gives us equal ratios. So when I draw my, my thing, Okay. All right, let's put our measurements in there. So let's, for lack of a better name, let's call that R1 and we'll call that one R2. They're clearly not equal. We'll call this length slant one and we'll call this length slant two. Here's what I can absolutely say. If I look at this two dimensionally, if I look at this two-dimensionally, then I will see the following. Okay. R1 is to R2 as S1 is to S2. Or you can say R1 is to S1 as R2 is to S2. I'm going to get equal ratios because I'm looking at something that's triangular as I look straight on. In other words, right, this would be kind of like the cross section. 
That gives us, in this picture, R1 is to R2 as S1 is to S2. That is an extremely important fact that's going to allow me to do this problem. So now let's go with, Nate had it right earlier. The surface area of the frustum of this cone is going to be the big surface area minus the little surface area. I think we're all pretty cool with that. Okay, that's really not anything that's <clears throat> excuse me, anything that's terribly complicated. So, what's the big surface area? So, the area that we want, I'll just call it area. The area that we want is the big surface area. So that would be pi r two s two. Minus the little surface area, that'd be pi r1 s1. Now, I can't do a whole lot with this yet. There's too many variables. I got r1, r2, s1, and s2. So why don't we do this? Let's call this length right here just, just straight up s, the length from here to here. Let's call that s. Clearly, s is going to equal s2 minus s1. Okay, it's what's left. What I'd really, really like to do is I would really like to rewrite this formula without S1 and S2. I would like to rewrite the formula with just S. So how the heck am I supposed to do that? Rewrite it with just S. Well, let's go back to the statement here. In this statement here, doesn't this imply then that R1 S2 equals R2 S1? Wouldn't that be automatically true? Everybody okay with that statement? Since that statement's automatically true, and I've got this statement here, let's start by factoring up the pi. Okay, now if I factor out the pi, <clears throat> excuse me, then the next thing I want to do is I want to, um, I want to replace, okay? I want to replace the, where is it? Um, I want to replace S1, okay? Uh, probably the, actually, let's see, which one do I want to replace? Sorry, hold on. Um, figure out. Oh, um, I want to replace S, well, I made myself notes, but I can't read them anymore. This one is, S2, S2, okay. It actually doesn't matter what order I do things, but I want to replace, let's say, might make it easier. I'm going to replace this S2 right here. Oh, okay, if I put that in there, then that would mean that S2 is S1 plus S. Okay, so this would be pi R2, S1 plus S, minus R1 S1, okay? Then I've got pi R2 S1 plus R2 S minus R1 S1. Okay, this is getting really complicated. Actually, no, because now, okay, everybody see what I can do here? I can replace this with this. And that would give us pi times R1 S2 plus R2 S minus R1 S1. Yikes, it's getting, and it was getting really busy. And then this S2 I'm going to get some really nice results in just a second. Let's go ahead and distribute. That's R1S1 plus R1S. What am I left with? R1S plus R2S. So that's pi times R1 plus R2 times S. My goal was to write this as an S instead of S1 and S2. I'm going to do it now a really weird step here. I'm going to write like this. I'm going to write it as two pi times one half r1 plus r2 times s. So why would I do such a crazy thing? It's not because I want the two pi. Now remember, 
ultimately we're going to be doing limits at some point. And I'm going to be making things really small. At some point, we're going to squish this really small. We're going to make S get really, really, really small. And so R1 and R2 are going to get closer and closer together. But in simple terms, what's another name for half the sum of, of two things? The average. The average. <laughs> this is the average of the R's. Oh, so how about if I wrote this as two pi? By the way, kind of a, a universal symbol for average is often a bar. So I'm going to do that. R bar, I mean average. I can now say that, oh my goodness, if I had just found the average radius, if I had just found the average radius, I could have said the surface area of the frustum of a cone was simply two pi times the average radius times that length. And that's what it is. We've just figured that out. Awesome. Now we can set up our problem. I got that result right there. That was the key. Wow. And by the way, there isn't any part of any of this that I have done that you will find anywhere. It's not online and it is absolutely not in any textbook anywhere. I have searched. I have never found any of this anywhere, which I find just to be ironic that this is one of the few areas in calculus where every author says, just accept this. And I'm pretty sure it's because the authors didn't actually know how it was derived. They just know it was true. They, we know it's true. They just didn't, didn't know where it came from. So now here's what I want to do. I want a simple, um, let's keep it simple. I've got y equal f of x. And I want to rotate it, you know, just like we did before. See, I want to rotate it about the x-axis. But I'm not interested in the volume of the resulting solid. I'm interested in the surface area of the resulting solid. Ah, so how do I find the surface area? Well, let's divide it up into a whole bunch of pieces. And let's say, for example, that's the i piece right there. But rather than square these off, I can't square these off. I'm not finding volume. I'm finding surface area. So I need the surface area of this slice. So I need to make that. I'm not squaring it off. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just going to align segment joining these. So this is definitely not a circular cylinder. No, no. No, if I, lay the, if I take that shape and I lay it down, anybody want to tell me what that shape is? A frustum. <laughs> This is the frustum of the cone. Oh, and we know how to find a surface area. So if I split this into a whole bunch of little pieces, I'm splitting it into a whole bunch of little frustums. And if I find the surface area of each frustum and then I add them up, there's my Riemann sum. Everyone sees that's my integral. So the volume, or not the volume, I'm sorry. The area of the ith slice would be, well, let's see. In general, we said, what was it? 2 pi times the average radius. Well, the average, that's easy. Let's just say 2 pi times the average radius times the slant. And I, I want to throw the word slant back in. Now, what would the radius be in this picture? Wouldn't that be the y value? Everybody see that? That's my radius would be the y value. So if you want, it's totally OK to say f of x. Now, what would the slant be? The slant would be that length, but that's the arc length parameter. I'm going to call that, that is, that is arc length. Oh, and we have a formula for arc length, don't we? It's square root of one plus dy dx quantity squared. All right, that's our, that's, again, we already know that this guy here involved one plus dy dx squared under the square root. So when I'm translating this into my integral, then my integral will become two pi, and let's just say, you know, a to b of what? Two, I'm oh, sorry, I already wrote two pi, sorry, f of x times the square root, yeah, sorry, yeah. f of x, one plus, now here's, it's dy dx, but I've already got f of x. So th this is where it gets kind of ugly. Whether you write dy dx quantity squared or you write f prime of x quantity squared, it doesn't really matter. I, I just think it looks kind of goofy writing f of x here, that's my y value, 
and then dy dx here. It's just the notation's a little cleaner. So you notice this is the arc length part we did before, but now I'm multiplying it by an additional term. And strangely enough, this additional term out in front for many, many, many different types of integrals, that additional term in front ends up being essentially a chain rule factor. So you are able to do certain problems that you could not have done otherwise just because of the existence of this term. Now, this is not the same formula for arc length. Arc length does not have a two pi. Arc length does not have an f of x. So these additional things are what makes it surface area. So the derivation of the surface area is probably the longest thing you'd ever do, believe it or not, certainly in Calc 1 or Calc 2 combined. There may be one derivation in Calc 3 that's longer than this, but this, is, this one is actually kind of huge. So let's do a couple of really simple examples. And I, I want to do simple examples. I don't want to do complicated ones. And again, most instructions on this is set up the integral to find the surface area, but we can't actually you know, finish. Let's do an easy one. Let's say the region bounded by y equals, let's see, let's do y equals x cubed again. Um, let's say y equals x cubed, x equal two, y equals zero is rotated about the x-axis, rotated about the x-axis, the axis, about the x-axis. And what we'd say is find the surface area of the resulting solid as opposed to finding the volume. Okay. So I've got this, this, this. That simple region, and I'm going to rotate it about the x-axis. So I get sort of that kind of thing going. All right. I could go right to the area is 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x times what? Well, this one's easy enough. We can just write it down. It's 1 plus the square of the derivative. Well, off to the side. What is dy dx in this case? 3x2. 3x squared. What's 1 plus the square of dy dx? Let's see, that would be 1 plus 9x to the fourth. Now, we did a problem similar to this to start the class today. Remember, we found or we tried to find the length of the curve. We tried to find exactly this problem. What we did earlier today was we tried to do this problem right here the length of that curve, and we couldn't. We fell short. See that guy right there? Is that exactly what I need right there? Yeah. I can integrate this one. I have a chain rule factor. So in this problem here, we would say, let u equal 1 plus 9x to the fourth. du would be 36x cubed dx. As x goes from 0 to 2, you will go from one, two to the fourth is 16, 16 times nine is 144, and then plus one would be 145, okay? Now, I don't quite have everything I need yet. I need, I need 36 X cubed. I only have an X cubed. So now I'm gonna rewrite the problem pi over 18 times the integral from 0 to 2 of 1 plus 9x to the fourth to the 1 half times 36x cubed dx. I squished in there. I just rewrote it in a form that now makes my substitution just automatic. So this will be pi over 18 times the integral from 1 to 145 u to the 1 half d. 
So that'd be u to the three halves times two thirds. I think we did one like that earlier. So pi over 27. So pi over 27, 145 to the three halves minus, what's one to the three halves? Anybody, what's one to the three halves power? One. One, yeah, this is right one. That's it. It's ugly, but it's my answer, okay? We were able to do this guy, and it, this wasn't that bad. This really wasn't that bad at all. Now, I'm going to leave it to you. If I take that semicircle that I did before, r squared minus x squared, and then I rotate it about the x-axis, I will create a sphere. I want you guys to try that on your own and find the surface area, and you're going to find that integration is absolutely a piece of cake because you get some canceling and some cool things happen. That one's really, really easy, and now you can derive the surface area of the sphere is very, very awesome. All right. You have learned or at least been exposed to everything you need to in a calculus one class. We are now finished with content. <sighs> now we can exhale and concentrate on the exams that come up. Now, our next exam, of course, is Tuesday. And the exam covers, uh, hold on, let me grab my syllabus here. I'd like to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, the last exam went through quiz 16. So this exam obviously starts with quiz 17 through quiz 24. So each exam has been on exactly eight lectures. So 17 to 24, the, the exam ending on the quiz you just turned in, the volumes by rotations, the disc washer method. So nothing from last day or today. Now the remaining quizzes, obviously, you're gonna turn in a quiz 25 and a quiz 26 that are the last two lectures. So that way, when you walk into the final, there are 26 lectures in this course, 24 of the lectures appear on the first three tests the last two lectures will still be on the last two quizzes. So that means when you take the final exam, every question on the final was either on an exam or a quiz or both. There is no mystery material, right? That's not gonna happen. So our exam of course is Tuesday. So I wanna mention a couple of things. You know, like always, I'm gonna email you the exams about 10 minutes early so you can print them or you can work staring at your computer the whole time. Um, Non-calculaic calculator, cheapos. Uh, Realistically on this exam, I mean, Simpson's trapezoid rule is probably the only problem where you actually need a calculator. You want something simple and cheap, no graphing calculators because you're being tested on your ability to integrate and the calculator can do that for you. Um, but then the calculator would have to get the grade, not you. Uh, formula cards. Now, I highly recommend that every test you start and make a new card because the previous information is not what you're being tested on. Besides which a lot of the older information you already know. So on this card here, we have 20 antiderivative formulas at this point. We've got over 20 derivative formulas. Should you put all the derivatives and all the antiderivatives on your formula card? Anybody? Probably just antiderivatives. Yeah, just put the antiderivatives. You see, if, if I put the antiderivative of cosine equals sine, don't I already know then the derivative of sine is cosine? You see, if you put the antiderivative formulas, you've already got secretly the derivative formulas just in reverse. It, it is not necessary to put both sets on there. So most people just put the integration formulas. But then there's a few others, you know, like Simpson's rule, trapezoid rule, a few, a few things of that nature. Um, it's really, this, this test is really about integration, obviously. OK, uh, you might want to put the definition of a Riemann sum on there because I'm going to ask you, you know, state the integral as a Riemann sum, you know, state it as a definite integral. I want that to be easy. Um, we 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 have one problem available that involved the summation formulas. You might want to put those down, you know, the sum of I, I squared, I cubed, because, uh, again, those weren't hard, but those aren't things you would remember off the top of your head necessarily. Now, we're in that position that a strong result on this exam basically seals your semester if you are not wanting to take the final. If you want to take the final, obviously a strong result on this exam then means one of the first two tests would be your drop score. So the final exam, if you take it, you're dropping your lowest test score and your lowest six quizzes and the final only counts if it exceeds your lowest test and six lowest quizzes. If you choose not to take the final because of the strength of all your grades, then the final exam receives a zero and that's your drop score. So you're either dropping your final 
or the lowest tests and six lowest quizzes. You're going to drop whatever's a lower score between the two. That's why you don't have to take the final. And people say, well, will final affect my grade? Only if it's better than your worst scores. Yeah. If it's worse than your worst scores, no, then, it, then it's the drop score altogether. So in preparation for this, this exam, you're automatically doing major prep for the final, because obviously if you're getting good at integration, then it means you're automatically going to be good at derivatives. It, it really does work that way. So let's take a short break. Uh, when we come back, I want exam related questions.